Welcome to Upstream. I'm Shane Morris. When someone in your church reveals that they have cancer, the response in most cases is instant. Meals will be brought, financial help will be given, rides will be arranged, prayers for healing will be lifted up, love will be shown copiously. But if someone in your church works up the courage to reveal that they are suffering from a mental illness or have thought about suicide, the response is usually very, very different. And this is true not only in the church, but in society as a whole. There is something dark, stigmatized, and ominous about the whole mental health issue. It's mysterious and scary. We don't understand it. And I can say from personal experience that we try not to learn that much about it until someone we love is the one suffering. Well, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and the state of mental health in this country has rarely, maybe even never, been worse than today. This is an issue that Christians are long overdue to think about carefully and intentionally. We need our response to be much more consistent and informed and rooted, above all, in hope. A hope that sees the problem for what it is and responds as Jesus would. Well, to help me do that today, I've invited back to the program someone who has helped me tremendously on this subject. Dr. Matthew Sleeth is a former emergency room physician and chief of a hospital medical staff who now teaches, preaches, and writes about faith and health. He was recognized by Newsweek as one of the nation's most influential Christian leaders, and he is executive director of Blessed Earth, as well as the author of several books, including one of my favorites, Hope Always, How to Be a Force for Life in a Culture of Suicide. Dr. Sleeth, welcome back to Upstream. Great to be back with you. Well, give us an update now, because it's been a while since our last conversation. What is the state of mental health in America? We are at the what looks to be the back end of a of a pandemic. Um, we have all kinds of other cultural and, and political and social factors revving up the tensions in, in our society and a lot of, uh, you know, just a lot of very heated arguments happening. Has anything changed um, since our conversation on Hope Always? Uh, I think things are getting worse mm. <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is really the change. There's no good news uh, to report really at this point. I, I want to sort of contrast um, or, or talk about one of the tensions that makes our current state so difficult to understand. Um, that I just looked at these reports. The Centers for Disease Control reports that uh, more than 500 kids between the ages of 10 and 14 died by suicide in the year 2020. And, and of course, these statistics are always a year or two um, behind, the, behind the current date. The New York Times actually this week had a fascinating piece. They said that in 2019, 13% of adolescents reported having a major depressive episode. That's a 60% increase from 2007. Emergency room visits by children and adolescents in that period also rose sharply for anxiety, mood disorders, and self-harm. And for people ages 10 to 24, suicide rates, which were stable from 2000 to 2007, leaped nearly 60% by 2018. And that's, again, CDC data. At the same time, and this is very weird, uh, the New York Times reports that young people are uh, more educated than at the beginning of the new millennium, less likely to get pregnant or use drugs, less likely to die of accident or injury. Um, but And by many markers, kids are doing fantastic and thriving. But there is this incredibly um, destructive and distressing undercurrent of mental health issues and suicide that the author of this piece says should stop us in our tracks. What's going on? Why is mental health getting worse while other measures of you know, well-being in teenagers are improving? I, I don't know that I can you know, uh, give a great answer to why certain things are improving. I know that we've come out of a very unusual period in our history with a long period of uh, people being uh, isolated from others and um, uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, certainly many students may have studied more during that time, but um, uh, they may have been you know, lacking the, uh, the social interaction that um, is, is kind of desperately needed by all of us who were built to be in community, but particularly when you're young, uh, time seems uh, so much greater an obstacle. In other words, if, 
if if you're told you're going to be um, um, uh, isolated for a month, let's say, and you're my age, well, you know that's what's what's a month out of a life my size. But but if you're uh, ten or thirteen or something, you know time is time is different to those, and I think they've really felt the impact of the isolation. Um, and and I'd have to say that also, uh, just the 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 news in general is is one of a country and a society that is more and more frayed at the seams. Uh, we see an equal rise in murders, um, and uh, which is very one, one, you know contrary to the the trend that's been happening for a long time. Like since the eighties, murders have been going down. Prior to that. Correct, and and there's been a very very sharp increase in that, and and in fact, uh, you could look at suicide as a, a a type of murder. The Bible says, "Thou shalt not kill," and it could just as easily say, "Thyself," uh, or someone else. And whether whether one is taking their own life or taking uh, someone else's life, you know, you're at a very desperate place that you know, we ideally shouldn't encounter at all at any point in our lives. But uh, so I, I don't know that I have the answers there. I don't know that anyone does. But my bottom, bottom line for the increase in the suicide rate um, is that we're seeing the results of a, a society that has unmoored itself from the anchor of its belief in an absolute right and wrong in, in, in God, in other words. So uh, that, that gets to the heart of one of the qu- questions that I know you deal with in, in Hope Always, and your approach to it was refreshing and very nuanced. And I think it's the question at the heart of uh, many Christian inquiries into the whole mental health issue, and that is, what to what degree is this a medical, physical problem? And to what degree... Is this a spiritual problem, and how should we respond accordingly? It, it seems to me that there's a great disconnect between the way the modern medical establishment sort of views this stuff and the way that many Christians view it. And I'm not enti- I'm not entirely convinced by either side's basic instinct on this. Talk to us about what your general approach to this is on an individual and like a statistical level? Is it spiritual? Is it physical? Is it both? What's going on? In order to answer that, and you get me back on track if I go too far down a bunny trail here, okay? But I I have a letter that I got off of a news service yesterday, and it's a story of a freshman at Southern University. She was a cheerleader. And I believe she was um, 19 years old, and she took her own life. And they actually published on, um, I think this is a um, uh, TikTok, uh, or it could have been Facebook, one, one of the social media platforms, where she wrote a goodbye letter. And she uh, says she's been fighting this for years and um, that people don't realize how much she's been struggling. She thanks her mother um, And she just says, I'm just tired of this and I I can't go on. Um, And she said, but she's going to let a lot of people down and she she feels that her life is unbearable. And then she says, I've lost my connection to God. The devil seems to have won and that's okay. I blame no one for this. I thank everyone for all they've done and I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Um, so w- here we have the mind of somebody right before they took their own life, and she's talking about spiritual things, but she's also talking about this depression that she's fought. And so I don't, I don't know that we can tease these things apart. Um, and I think in in trying to do that, we may miss the holistic approach to somebody with mental illness and that is that it's it's both physical it's both mental and it's and it's spiritual i i don't think that we can tease the human psyche apart and dissect it and only work on one part of it i just i don't think that works let me give you a follow-up in light of that if you had talked to me you know 10 years ago about this question 
and I'm glad nobody did, and I'm glad there was never a microphone, and I'm glad that it never got put on any podcast, because what I said would have probably been very stupid. Um, there's, But there's this perception, and I'm speaking on behalf of what I would have thought 10 years ago, this, this perception mm -hmm. um, that this is, to a large extent, a new problem, that um, the diagnosis of mental health issues is just insane right now it, it is through the ceiling and it's much like you know how every other boy in school has adhd now everybody's got depression everybody's got bipolar everyone's got something or other you know everyone's always having a panic attack and the the i think the strong version of this argument is to marshal someone like philip reef um, where he talks about how the, the therapeutic has triumphed, right? We think of everything in therapeutic terms now. We don't have pastors anymore. We have therapists. What would you say to the, the kind of argument or observation that mental health seems to be dominating our discourse about the human soul right now? Are we overdiagnosing? Are we mislabeling other problems um, as mental health? Again, I don't think that this is the case. But I know that's an argument out there. What would you say in response? There probably is some of that, um, uh, but you know, if we, if we take as an endpoint someone actually taking their life, those numbers are real. Mm. Those numbers are disturbing, and those numbers are ever on the increase. And we see a different cohort, and that's the young people that you're talking about. Uh, thinking about this as a viable option if life gets too hard. I, I do believe that, that, um, that we have also, uh, you know, we've, we've changed parenting styles. Every child is supposed to um, be a winner and get a trophy and that, and, and that sort of thing. And frankly, I got a swat on the rear end um, uh, quite a bit instead of uh, being told I was I was great. And maybe that swat on the rear end toughened me up uh, a little bit. And so I think there's there's an element to what you're saying, but nonetheless, if we take as an endpoint somebody taking their own life, it, it's certainly increased and it's alarming. And uh, and we and and we would ignore it at our peril. I think. Yeah. Um, this is something too that's that's not just statistical. You know, normally you focus people normally focus on the anecdotes first, and then they go to the statistics to find out what's really true. Um, you look at the statistics; that they're bleak. Um, we just talked about a little bit of them at the beginning there, um, but anecdotally, I hear this all the time. I actually um, I actually go diving with this guy who is a he's a PE teacher here in Florida, and. Um, we, you know, it, when we're sitting on the boat, we're talking, and, and he talks about how, you know, back when he was a kid, everyone was just playing their sports and, um, and you know, dealing with their their high school politics and trying to figure out how to, you know, how to get over the bullies and stuff in their in their school, just regular teenage stuff. He goes, nowadays, all my kids, half of them come in with like cut marks on their wrists, and they're talking about who attempted suicide. And like, who is having a gender transition and who wants to now be addressed in a different way or, or who was hospitalized in a, in a mental health institution? It's just like an endless um, cascade that he, he's experiencing in the schools. And I hear this kind of story again and again. Um, and it just raises this, like, it's an existential question for parents, for educators, for anybody who just cares about the, the mental state of kids. Why kids? Why teenagers? Why now? What is it that's changed so dramatically? I I read articles that that say, well, we can't point to a single factor, <laughs> but in so many ways, I'm just not satisfied with that answer. Is there is there an instinct that you've come to, um, or something you can point to to say this is the major, you know, breakwater where we changed and and it resulted in this this uh, just frankly um horror we're seeing in young yeah, people i i think that um you know there used to be a kind of saying well how are you going to keep them down on the farm once you know they've been to the big city <laughs> or, or whatever and um in, in that we because everybody carries a connection to everybody else in the world in their pocket um, that that is certainly changed, 
and um, that that people are constantly comparing themselves uh, to others and how many likes they have and people are called influencers who shouldn't be influencing anybody they're just children you know whether they're 50 or 13 they're they're simply uh, you know children and and I think that's probably the 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 largest change um uh you know i think that it's it's hard to be content in life when you're constantly bombarded with a cornucopia of things of ideas and um of a, a world that values um things that that are not substantive uh, and and so you know to try to try to make a nuanced discussion to a 10 year old about that is very difficult they simply want to be popular now they want to have the thing that they're seeing on their phone or to have the phone that the other other person um, had and so um, I, I would say that that's the major change and if I were going to um, if I had children right now, they would not have phones, um, period. I, I just, um, you know, if you, you think about the concept of handing a 10-year-old uh, keys to your car and say, here, take it anywhere you want, they're not going to probably end up in a good place, but they literally can, with a a smartphone end up in the darkest alleys of society um, now and uh, you know s subject to um, you know in influences that are being made on them that you know just weren't there 30 years ago yeah you know the the instinct I share your instinct to look at you know social media the connectedness the always-on nature of our lives and the, the ubiquity of screens um, in the New York Times talks about that as kind of a, one of the big prevailing theories of the instincts people have, because the fact is the rise in, in um, suicide among young people corresponds very nicely with the, the rise of that technology. Um, and, and they say that the data is sort of in, inconclusive, that there are some associations, but there are some mitigating factors and it's still being studied and they're, they're not really sure. Um, I look at the harms as I, it is, and I say, "Yeah, I'm not going to let my kids have that at that stage. They're not ready for it." Yeah, I I don't think um, I I think to say that the, it's not established whether or not that is harmful mm -hmm. is kind of like in 1960s saying that it we nobody's really proved that cigarettes are bad for your right. <laughs> health. <laughs> uh, I think it is without a doubt harmful, and um, and and I think it's been proven. Um, and I think that that money is winning out here um, in, in that we, you know, a cell phone doesn't come with a sticker on it. You know, caution, this this may be harmful um, to your health and you may take your life, um, you know, because of this. You know, why in the letter that I just read you, why, why would you publish this for the world uh, to see if you're, at, you know, and. I, I recall a statistic about folks jumping off the uh, uh, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, um, which I believe you cannot do anymore. There's netting systems under it that finally, after the uh, the person in charge of the commission of the Bay Bridge's, um, I believe it was his nephew, jumped off. Finally, after decades, they uh, spent the tens of millions to make it safe but before that 99.9% .9 of people jumped off the side facing the city you could have jumped off either side but people are making a communication uh, with this um, <clears throat> they're not they're not doing an, an abstraction of the rest of society in other words yeah not to be uh, too gloomy here but one of the aspects of the conversation that we had about hope always was your kind of lengthy um, exploration of the suicide statistics and where they've gone over the years. And, and you actually made the case at that point, and I just re-listened to the episode a few hours ago, you just you made the case that um, the, the statistics of who actually kills themselves um, underestimates 
the true suicide rate today versus, say, during the 1930s. Re kind of rehearse that for us so that we understand what's really going on and the magnitude of the problem. Sure. Uh, we measure suicides by the number per 100,000. And it's about 14 and a half per 100,000 uh, for the entire population of the United States. So that's um, for every 100,000 population, you'll have 14 and a half uh, suicides per year. That is equivalent to the all-time high that was reached in the 1930s during a period called the Great Depression. And... Um, but what I what I did on that show and what I continue to do for folks is kind of unpack that because um, in in the 1930s, if someone uh, tried to take their own life, by and large, they were successful. Uh, and, and really, it's technology now that's that's making a difference. Now we have uh, uh, everyone has a cell phone in their pocket. We can call for help. In 1930, fewer than 40% of homes had telephones in them. When we call for help today, we mobilize a 911 system. We don't even have to know where they are. Um, we, you know, we can we can be in a field somewhere, and they can track us with that phone. And and what we're bringing to um, uh, uh, to bear on that is generally a a mobile hospital unit with a paramedic in it. Um, in the 1930s, it would have been an ambulance that all they could have done is what they called bag and drag, <laughs> you know, just, um, uh, and, and today a paramedic can reverse an overdose of benzodiazepines. Uh, that's the Valium type drugs. They can overdose a, uh, they can uh, reverse an overdose of narcotics. That would be like heroin, fentanyl, morphine. Um, if they can't r get you breathing uh, on your own, they can breathe for you. You can be placed on a ventilator. All of these things were missing in 1930. So that um, if we didn't have modern technology, I believe that our suicide rate would be somewhere uh, around 300 per 100,000 per year. So orders of magnitude more than it in it was. And it's just technology that's saving us. And the example I give of this is I, I was, and I don't know whether I did it on your radio show, but I had to stop in traffic in, um, in, uh, in the city where I live. And it's a place where people often have rear end collisions because traffic slows down very rapidly. And I stopped and, and then I looked in the rear view mirror to see what my fate was going to be. And there was a young fella with his cell phone and it kind of draped over the steering wheel. No clue that I was, he was barreling into me at 30 miles an hour in the rear end. And then he dropped his cell phone and his mouth fell open because his car had applied the brakes. Um, this, this young fellow was fortunate to be in a brand new Mercedes SUV, which, uh, the, his car kept him from wrecking into me. Now he went home and didn't tell his parents, I'm sure, gee, I wasn't paying attention. I was texting and I almost, you know, snapped somebody's neck <laughs> in traffic. Nonetheless, he's just as bad a driver as can be technology made him look quote better than he was and that's what's happening with suicide is that we have so much technology that can save people keep them alive um, etc that the full extent of the desperation that's out there in society is is way way worse than it looks we've talked about the worsening suicide rate and obviously suicide is kind of a very um, concrete metric of usually it's depression um, and we can, you, you know, we can measure that. We can demonstrate that it's not overdiagnosis. It really is people taking or attempting to take their own lives. But of course, depression um, and the other symptoms that'll lead you toward suicide are just one of uh, a real panoply of different um, mental health issues. And we think of that as, as the main issue because it's the most dramatic one. But we also have, uh, you know, issues like bipolar disorder, um, schizophrenia. Uh, are these things uh, are these things increasing? What is your sense um, about how um, mental health other than depression and suicide are f 
faring? And, and how should we look at these things as like intrinsic or environmental? Are they um, are they affected the same way that depression is? Great, great question. I I think that for certain mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, the rate of schizophrenia has been steady over time and over cultures, um, and in that that has not really uh, changed. Um, and but I believe that the the rate of what would be called unipolar depression just you know, uh, a, a prevailing uh, sadness, hopeless, helpless is definitely on the rise and is definitely influenced by um, what's going on around us in, in society. Hmm. What's your sense right now of, um, because you've been out of the, um, you know, running an emergency room for a while, what's your sense of the experience of a physician who's in there now? compared to what it was like for you. Yeah, I, I have friends that are still <laughs> very much uh, every day uh, uh, going to work. And, it, and it's just, it's, it's much, much uh, uh, worse. And um, they're, they're dealing with it on a, uh, you know, a level that I didn't even have to, although it was an everyday thing uh, for, for me. Um, but they're also dealing with family structures that are more shattered um, than before. And people, as you mentioned, are having you know, basic questions about their identity. Um, who are they? And, and I think that society can coast for a while <clears throat> um, with any given thought, including good thoughts like we're Christian and we're made in the um, image of God. Um, but that it, that eventually, you know, you kind of, you have to begin to ask that question, who am I, what am I, why am I here? And um, moder uh, post-Christian modernist thinking doesn't have any good answers for those. You're here because of an accident. Nothing matters ultimately because when you die, that's the end. Those, those are pretty, uh, and we've done away with the hero. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's the it's the age of the anti-hero. Um, people are are famous in society for for frankly things they would have been shunned for um, you know a, a generation ago, and so these these are all um, I think being reflected in in the mental health, if you were uh, numbers that we're seeing, particularly the depression. This is the best thing to be said in my thinking for the Christian instinct on this, which I don't want to bash, which says that there is a spiritual component to this. I, I think you can fall off the, you know, fall off the road on that side and say, well, everything's just a spiritual issue. Everything's demonic oppression. Everything is, you know, that you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Um, but there, there is such a strong tendency in our society as a whole to see everything as physical, that it is good that we recognize the spiritual component here. Um, we, we should push back against that, uh, that instinct in our society as a whole. Um, well, and I, and I would, I would say that let's say somebody is a Christian yeah. and they're very involved in their faith and yet they experience depression um, I think some of those people are the, quote, canary in the coal mine. They're looking up. They're seeing what's going on in the world. They're not having a whole lot of confidence in the future. And if you happen to be raising children or something like that, um, you love God. God loves you. But what the heck is going on? <laughs> you know, and and um, and you cannot. No man is an island uh, uh, as the. Uh, as the saying goes, and that whether or not we're Christians, we live in a milieu of the world, which at the moment is um, is questioning all of its previously held values, um, and in I don't think it's going well, frankly. I get the sense that, and, and you use this phrase in the book that I really liked, and it stuck with me ever since. And you call ours an unlivable society. And I get the sense that there are multiple 
um, factors contributing to that reality. You know, we, we mentioned social media. We mentioned the breakdown of the, of the traditional family. Um, we mentioned the kind of isolation that generally accompanies a, a move in an increasing technological direction. And then, of course, the, the decline of faith as a central part of who people are in, in, their, in their lives and their self-understanding has contributed to this um, set of circumstances that I, I wonder if it really is incompatible with the human design, with human nature. If, if we might look back at some point on the set of conditions that we have created in the modern world and go, gosh, that was just like when they used to, you know, handle mercury at, at schools, you know, as, with, with the kids in science class just for fun. Or when they used to like play with radioactive isotopes it you know like Mary Curie did right um, just as, in the in the name of experimentation or or when they used to uh, even use them at, for therapeutic purposes right we look back on that stuff and we say what were they thinking you know the Romans drank out of lead goblets what on earth were these people thinking they didn't know that they were doing something that was extremely bad for them and I wonder if in the future, people will look back and say they thought they could stare at a screen for 10, 11, 12 hours a day and be okay in puberty? Like, what were they thinking? Of course the kids were suicidal at that point. What, what do you, what is a, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it's just one of the, one of the Christian uh, disciplines, activities, um, ways of ordering life that I am just huge on is the Sabbath. Hmm. And um, you wrote a book on that. It's, it's called uh, 24 I, 6, right? Correct. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm huge on this because it's, it's the way God made the universe. If, if we read scripture and you believe scripture, and I do, um, God created heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. And then he rested on, on the uh, seventh day. And for the last couple thousand years in Western society, that has been the pattern of doing life, is to work five or six days a week and then rest one of those days and to spend that time um, thinking about things other than getting ahead. Um, everything reverses on the on the Sabbath of the Lord's Day. You know, every other day we're trying to make money. That's the day we give it away. Um, every every other day we go to work. That's the day we go to not work. Um, and um, that every other day, you know, we we kind of take pride in what we're achieving. That's the day we take, you know, pleasure in what we're not achieving. And I just, um, I don't think that you can subtract something like that from society and not have something go off the rails, not have some change. And it has been well established that uh, a committed Christian is about six times less likely to take their life. But it's even been established that Sabbath keepers live longer than, than other people. You know, this has been come at from a number of directions. And so, again, to, to take all of that away um, is, uh, is, is going to affect society. And, and I, can't, I can't change the world. I can't reinstitute the blue laws that, that made Sabbath go. But I can do it for my family, and I can encourage the people I love and the people I don't love um, to, to take uh, one day of rest. And so that's where the hope begins to come into this. I, I can't affect what Hollywood is putting on Netflix or s streaming on Amazon. But I can choose to turn that off or I can choose to have a, a period of time in my life where that doesn't get put into my, my soul and my psyche. Um, if you think that, uh, you know, watching a screen that doesn't change your, your, your life and the way you do business, by the way, I'm just going to, I remember having little kids and they hadn't seen the first Star Wars <clears throat> 
and 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 so and somebody said oh they really your kids are going to have eventually you know eight fingers on each hands and not get along and they got to see star wars so they watched star wars and the next day my son was going up the stairs and my my daughter was coming down and my son said out of my way rebels come <laughs> to his beautiful little sister (laughs) like you said how can how can you think you can put a kid in front of a screen for six seven eight nine ten hours a day and that's not going to have an effect um it's it's uh it's it's i i think we really will look back like you said by the way i was one of those kids that played with mercury in your palm it is a lot of fun (laughs) (laughs) oh boy (laughs) but but my kids do have two heads each. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I was about to ask about those eight fingers. Um, I remember reading uh, Stephen Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage, which is kind of his chronicle of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it talks about how mm-hmm. the men on the expedition, you know, would contract a lot of venereal diseases along the way. And, uh, and, and Meriwether Lewis prescribed mercury that they would rub on themselves, guess where? to uh, relieve the symptoms. And it's just, you know, he's cringing the whole time talking about how bad this was for them without them knowing it. And and you're cringing, but they didn't know it. They thought it was a, you know, a cure at the time. And I wonder about these parents, and it's not to come down too hard on anyone, but parents who, like in the New York Times article, talked about how they thought they just had to give their kid a smartphone, not a phone, a smartphone, because they do still sell flip phones. Uh, at 10 years old, that was the age of this this kid under consideration in the Times article. And I just think, I cannot imagine giving my daughter a smartphone in one year. The stuff that she's inevitably going to be exposed to, while she's still in the process of sort of um, programming her human operating system, right? To, to figuring out who she is and how it what it means to live as a person in the world to be subject to all those artificial pressures in a in an artificial space would just be crippling. And I, I'm so thankful for my childhood because I didn't have access to any of that stuff. Uh, and some of my younger siblings did. So there's just this big generational divide. Um, and it's it's sad, but I don't uh, I, I don't really sympathize with parents who think, oh, I don't see the big deal. I'm just going to give my kids this technology. Yeah, it's, you know, Jesus addresses smartphones, um, <laughs> and he says that it would be better to enter heaven without a smartphone than to lose your salvation. There you go. And, you know, he's he's talking about those things that drag us away um, from keeping our eyes on the kingdom. And I recall being at a seminary when the dean of student life was talking about uh, a student that had to be pulled from class and sent to an inpatient uh, facility because they were totally um, involved in pornography. And um, and then this person was talking about, the, it happened to be a woman, um, was going to be brought back into the student body. And I said, well, what what are the accommodations for her not having a computer? And the 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 dean said, "Oh, you can't function without a computer, so we're just gonna hope you know that it goes well." But that's where Jesus was talking about. No, it would be better to 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 lose a leg or an eye or a hand. Um, and uh, I think that. In, in general, the older somebody is when you introduce them to an addictive um, uh, item, <laughs> I'll just use item, the more they are able to resist it. They still can become addicted. But when you give a six-year-old cigarettes, they're hooked, period. They, they have no no shot. So giving a 10-year-old this incredible... This, um, 
addictive thing. And, you know, if you look even uh, online video games, they're advertised by this is totally addictive. That's what is in the, the advertisement. So don't tell me that, that the makers of cell phones and, you know, social network platforms are not trying to make their product uh, addictive. And so at the very least for your listeners, I would say keep those kids um, away from those uh, addictive. You're, you're not going to hand your, your 10-year-old a martini. <laughs> it, it, and um, because we know that's addictive now. Um, and, you know, heads up, a smartphone is an addictive device and, um, uh, and, and is best introduced at a much later date in time than when most parents are getting those for their kids. The, the New York Times introduced a helpful idea or a nuance in that conversation of what social media and technology does to contribute to the suicide epidemic. And that was that it, it doesn't always have to do just with the smartphones and the technology and the internet and the social media themselves, it has to do also with what those things are depriving you of or what those things are replacing. So they talked about exercise. Um, they talked about sleep. They talked about um, time spent in nature, unstructured play time in the outdoors. All of these things tend to suffer or be subtracted from in order to make room for the technology. So it may not just be that the, in fact, it probably isn't that the technology itself is doing the damage, but it's it's the fact that it's taking the place of things that are vital for the mental health and growth and, of young people. And as far as I can see, um, the, the basis for considering sleep, time in nature, um, unstructured play as vital to the development of a young brain and a young personality uh, is very strong, very firmly established. And we also know that technology tends to take away from those things. And I have an, ex I have an experiential um, a sort of agreement with that. Immediately, I think, back to the, the unstructured playtime I had as a kid, the amount of time I spent outdoors, you know, with bugs and lizards and sticks and stuff. <laughs> And um, the amount that, and you've written a book on trees, right? So trees in the Bible. So you really, you really resonate with this. But um, the the amount that that contributed to my mental well being versus establishing an artificial personality on the internet, which I never got to do um, until much, much later in life, that was so indispensable, and I would never trade it for um, what kids today typically have. As a uh, well, it sounds like you want to say something, but. Keep this, no, ahead, this question in mind. As a, a parent who's kind of finished the race, right? What would you say to parents today who are um, trying to live in live and parent in light of that fact? Great question. Well, I think the the thing f when I was raising children that was the opioid uh of the time was television mm. and uh you know i remember those e there's something that happens to kids around 5 30 6 30 somewhere in there uh where they they all this mass insanity yes. happens right as you're trying to yep. put dinner on the I, table I, maybe I, that I, didn't I, happen yeah. at your house oh no but, no no you know, it's hap happening at my house uh in about an hour here <laughs> okay <laughs> And in how easy it is to sit a kid down in front of a screen to get yourself a little peace. And yet that, that is the beginning of the end, if you will. And um, I, I have a wonderful employee who works for me, and she came to us, tears in her eyes, saying, I, I have to resign because uh, she has three children, and she says, I, I realize that I'm sticking them in front of, of a screen too much of the time. And, um, and, it's, and it's work for you guys or work at um, raising my children in what is difficult. Um, and, and that is not just sticking them in front of the screen, but having them go out in the yard, having them play, that sort of thing. And so I... 
I just uh, absolutely agree with you on that. Um, you, you know, using that narcotic of the masses, whether that's the television or the crack cocaine of a smartphone, <laughs> if you'll uh, go with that, is that you you can do what's hard now and it's going to make things easier later, or you can give in and and just um, you know kind of go with the flow and and pay for it later later on it's pay me now or pay me later kind of thing and it's always um better to set the boundaries uh when your children are young to teach them how to be um self-reliant uh self-entertaining um uh, self-starting as far as their learning and, and that type of things. Frankly, I don't want Big Bird. I didn't want Big Bird raising my children. So there were things even then, uh, you know, that that we, we just, we subtracted. And um, and and we had uh, the, the Sabbath as, uh, you know, just a regular kind of tool in life. And um, I don't think you and I have done a, 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 a talk about Sabbath, have we? No, but I, I <clears throat> it's a true story. Now I'm going to brag about my kids, and they're grown, so I'm allowed to do that. Um, my kids were in high school, and it was a very rigorous high school. It um, had graduated one president and 50 congressmen and senators, if that gives you, you know, an idea. And... Uh, and my wife was teaching there um, as my, my kids were going to school. And a teacher came and said, your kids are not going to make it here. They're not going to be competitive unless they do homework on Sunday. It's just too big a chunk of time, if you look at it, to subtract from them, to take away from them. And you're going to forever handicap them if you take that away. And... Um, and we went with the Sabbath instead. <clears throat> and my son uh, was the Val Victorian of that, that high school. My, my daughter didn't graduate from high school. She applied to uh, college early. She missed two questions on her SATs. She disputes one, but that's neither here nor there. And she was accepted to college as a 15-year-old. Um, both of them kept that that uh, pattern of not working on Sunday, of not ever doing homework on that day. And both of them graduated uh, at the top of their class. Or you could say, oh, high school and college, that's no big deal. My son did the same thing in medical school. And, um, and he got... I'm going to give you three guesses where he graduated in his class ranking. <laughs> and the first two don't count. He graduated the first in his class. The youngest med school graduate at University of Kentucky. Now, they're smart kids. They got a Jewish mom. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, there's a zillion smart kids with Jewish moms. They had something nobody else had. And that is they had one day out of every seven in which they were loved and known and their identity was being a human being, not a human doing. And um, I think it's things like throwing away the smartphones, honoring the Sabbath, um, having more family time, that sort of things, uh, the, the opposite of the way the whole world is going that are the things that Christians have at their disposal, that we have positive reinforcement for through our th theology and through our history, that are, are really where the hope it is. And I, I can't stress enough to fall back on, on some of those things to help you in your parenting. We open this episode by talking about the church's response to um, mental health issues and how markedly different it often is from the response to um, regular health issues. And, and over the course of our discussion, we've um, sort of talked about the, the difference between the two, the fact that uh, human beings are not just material creatures. We are um, we are embodied souls, right? We're spiritual. We have a, an immaterial aspect. Um, 
And so it seems like to me there's two different errors we can fall into. You know, we could fall into the materialistic error that says, well, just throw medication at the problem and that'll fix it. Uh, and th there's nothing else that needs to be addressed. And then there's the, uh, I guess, the spiritualized component, which often contributes to that reaction that I described, where the church dis uh, often dis uh, reacts to mental illness in a different way than we'd react to um, illness as a whole. Describe for me the healthiest kind of reaction that a church can have. What is the what is the right pattern of response on an individual and corporate level to finding out that someone in your congregation, someone that you love, someone you know, uh, is suffering from, let's say, depression or, or another mental health issue that places that person at risk for all kinds of bad outcomes. What's the Christ-like response? I think the Christ-like response is to <clears throat> um, first have the ministry of presence, being present with those people, and in understanding that both physical and, and mental illness are part of the human condition. Um, that uh, we look at scripture and we find mental illness, um, and we look at the history of Christianity and we find some of the heroes of the faith um, suffered with mental illness. Uh, Spurgeon, uh, the quote, Prince of Preachers, um, suffered with depression for throughout most of his life. Uh, Mother Teresa did. Henry Nouwen did. C.S. Lewis had a couple of very, very dark years. Um, and, and that it doesn't mean that God loves you less, and it means that the church should love you um, just as God does, which is to never, never leave you, um, that type of thing. I don't think that we should put mental illness up on a pedestal, on the other hand. Um, it, it just as you shouldn't put cancer or anything else like that up on a pedestal. Um, but, but to recognize that um, uh, it does not mean that God loves you less, that you're, you're um, battling mental illness or that you have it in your family. I think we, um, <clears throat> uh, we, and we also need to accept those good things that come from science and technology. And good things do come from science and technology. And there are, you know, wonderful treatments for schizophrenia that are available today that were not there, um, you know, a generation ago. And, and, and to be thankful for those things. Um, but I, th I think the other... Uh, I, th I, I, I don't want anyone to come into church and feel like they're not welcome because they're not perfect because that's where God meets us. He, he meets us in our imperfection. That does not mean that he wants us to stay there forever. Um, I think that the, the Lord is, at least my experience of 20 years of being a Christian, um, is that God is always working on some defect in my character um, etc. And sometimes he's worked on defects in my physical health, you know, like lose weight and the, those type of things. Um, uh, because this is this body belongs to God. When when I have that view, then I'm going to try to work with God and work with other people um, to get myself in the best shape to do ministry. And we're all in the business of, of ministry if we're Christians. Um, so, uh, for a church, I think that the first way to go about this is, is to, to explore what scripture has to say on it. And that's what I do in, in the Hope Always book is to kind of unpack that. And then to have some real practical things of how do you, how do you incorporate, um, prayer and confidentiality and those type of things for folks who are suffering, um, from mental illness. And I have seen, the church, when it does do this, I've been to a couple churches and talked about this that are moving to have kind of teams that are are there just for folks who come in that ha are having mental illness. Um, uh, in and I think that that's why I do this work is is that the church will adapt and do just as the church did in the time of John Wesley when it came to dealing with physical illness. And I don't know if we discussed it at all, but um, in, in Wesley's time, 
uh, uh, physical illness was treated the same as mental illness is today. There's no way that you would come into church and say, please uh, pray for my cancer or whatever. Um, the, the thought was that if you're ill, that's because you have sin and you need to work this out, you know, um, with God. Wesley found that and, and was so kind of appalled by the state of the church that he wrote a uh, first aid book, if you will. It's called Primitive Physic, and it was his best-selling book ever. And and the church became involved in people's physical health. And I would like to see the church become more and more involved in, in uh, the mental health. And most churches of any size have mental health workers in them. And and I think the church needs to turn to that person and say, instruct us, and how can we help you? If there's someone listening who is actually in the mental health profession, so say they're a, a certified counselor, um, all the way up to a psychologist, um, and they're struggling to figure out how to incorporate their faith into their practice, um, what's the balance there? How do you do a good job guiding someone toward mental well-being. And obviously this isn't your field, um, but you've observed this and you've seen success stories and you know what a good job looks like in the, on this front. Um, what would you say uh, that person should focus on in terms of you know guiding people toward faith versus guiding them toward mental health? What's the, what's the point there that you can uh, settle on without you know proselytizing? Or should you? <laughs> Great question. Um, the uh, in, in a difficult one because in mental illness there's something that you encounter called hyper religiosity, which is a sign of severe mental illness. Yes, and and so you 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 cannot be praying with that person, right? Uh, like you would with some somebody else. The, the friends that I have, and I have a friend who introduces himself as a Christian psychiatrist, um, went to a residency, Duke University, used to have a Christian psychiatry residency, and not that long ago. Hmm. Um, and those folks are just very, very skilled at balancing those things. And I think you let somebody know where your source of strength comes from, um, that you don't you don't push that on people. Um, but, uh, you know, when I read this, this part of this letter to you, this person is dealing with mental illness, but they're also dealing with a spiritual crisis here. And I think that for those counselors, um, you want to take at the very least, a spiritual inventory. That's, by the way, the law of the land. Hmm. Um, you, when somebody's admitted to the hospital, you are supposed to ask about uh, take a spiritual inventory. And you can unpack that a little bit more. And some people may have, um, uh, particularly around um, uh, the mental illness of depression, you can get loaded up with guilt and things that the Bible is... Um, very helpful sometimes in taking some of that guilt off of people's shoulders um, that that need for perfection that sort of thing in our first conversation you mentioned as people you ask very difficult questions <laughs> by the way <laughs> thank you that that is part of my job description and I'm it, I'm getting better and better at it I think so <laughs> um, and and honestly this is for me an exploration as much as it is for my listeners um, and I, I wanted to have you on to sort of wrestle through some things that are, in my mind, very open-ended questions still, uh, questions that I don't quite know how to fully resolve or tensions that I don't know how to fully hold together. You know, I, I had, I've had several guests on to talk about G.K. Chesterton recently, and one of his big ideas is that uh, truth is found in the tensions between great, uh, great things that we need to affirm, you know, doctrines and ideas that are true, but that seem to contradict each other. They don't contradict each other. It's a paradox. And once we you know, assume God's perspective, they fit together. And I think that the paradox of uh, you know, the working of the brain and the well-being of the spirit, are uh, that, that paradox is difficult to untangle, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't ask those questions and focus on it very uh, devotedly, especially in a time when mental health is in such bad shape. For me, that's an open question and an open quest. And, and and 
the the reality is that Christianity is both very simple and also the most complicated set of thoughts, you know, that that have probably ever been as simple because they reflect God. And and uh, people are looking for answers, and easy answers are so much more appealing than difficult answers. And um, and and I've seen people, particularly in mental health, get involved in these scam scams of scanning brains and you know this this type of thing. Um, real faith and real religion is complicated, just as life is, and um, that's part of the problem of staring at a screen for ten hours because everything has to be resolved before the end of the hour. <laughs> If, if you will, uh, but life is not that way, and and so uh, I tell people that ninety nine percent of the frustration in their lives is the difference between reality and their expectation, and um, and if you come to expect easy answers, and who doesn't when you can say, hey Siri, what's the meaning of the universe, and something will be spit out. Um, versus the complicated business of life of searching for God and searching for reason and meaning and that 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 type of thing um, and in Christianity and I've only been a Christian for 20 years but it seems to me in reading from across the centuries we've really lowered the bar to a very simple um, often presentation that that underrepresents the nuances of God and Jesus telling us to be wise as serpents. Mm. <clears throat> well, I want to ask one last question here, and it's a very practical one. It has to do with how a Christian should behave when he or she finds a loved one, fellow member of the church, a friend in a spiral that looks to be leading towards suicide um, or self-harm. You talk about in the book how... Uh, there are a number of fears that people have about confronting that and about mentioning it that are, are really unfounded and that there is a healthy way to to confront with love someone who, who looks to be in a negative spiral, to, to intervene as, you know, we talked about people, uh, people do, as you have done yourself with people who are on the, on the brink of death due to suicide. So walk us through what it looks like to intervene in a godly way, and what are the fears people have that are unfounded? Yeah, the the number one fear that people have is that I'm going to make this situation worse, um, including I'm going to put the idea of suicide into the person's head. And I just like to reassure you, as I was reassured, and everyone who's gone through medical school or school becoming a clinical psychologist or uh, social worker that asking that question reduces the chances of somebody um, suiciding. Um, that uh, what that question asked means is that I care about you enough to bring up something that is a taboo still in society. And so you you ask um, the the person, have you thought about harming yourself or have you thought about suicide? And I recall um, a time when my wife was on the phone and she dropped by some folks we were involved with who had just moved to the United States and had a uh, a ten year old child who voiced some concerning things about not wanting to be alive. And I said, you got to ask this question. And she did, and and the answer was yes. He's thinking about committing suicide. This is a ten year old, by the way. And um, and I said, then you've got to ask, does does he have a plan? Um, so if somebody has a plan to use firearms, um, you have to ask, are there firearms in the house? This young fellow's plan was to use knives that were in the kitchen. He'd already picked out which one he was going to use to uh, to. Um, cut his throat and um, at that point he needed to be taken to a hospital and he was and that 
person, you know, a couple of years later is integrated into society and doing great. So my wife overcoming that, and if you need to get somebody like me on the phone and ask, what do I do here? Um, literally save that young, young person's uh, life. So get over the fear that you're going to make it worse. Ask the question, then ask, do they have a plan? And if they have a plan in the means, you need to get that person help uh, right away. Well, Dr. Sleeth. Uh, and, the, and the worst thing you can do is say, oh, you don't really feel that way. Right. So don't don't deny their feelings. Right. That's very helpful. Well, Dr. Sleeth, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I know that my listeners, if they have not heard you before, on the program, uh, they're going to have some questions about. Well, this guy talks about the Sabbath. He talks about trees. He talks about you know mental health and medicine. What what is um, what is your overall mission, and where can they go to to find out more about that? <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> The common thread is that I write about things that um, the church either has forgotten about or hasn't noticed in a while, or that type of thing. Um, and uh, Blessed Earth or MatthewSleeth.com uh, are, are two places they can they can find out more. I, I, I think the bottom, bottom line on the thread between what I'm doing is it's all about stewardship, mm. whether that's stewardship of the earth, whether that's stewardship of our time, um, uh, stewardship of our lives. Um, it's it's uh, stewarding the things that God God gave us. Well, my guest today has been Dr. Matthew Sleeth, former emergency room physician and author of Hope Always, How to Be a Force for Life in a Culture of Suicide. And of course, we're talking about this because uh, this month, May, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And uh, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart and to Dr. Sleeth's heart, uh, I know. And I I'm thankful that he was able to join me here on the program. So Dr. Sleeth, thanks again. And uh, God bless you, brother. I appreciate your work. 